Uh, my name is Thomas DeZamba. I'm the, the Deputy Program Manager here at the Missoula Fire Sciences Lab. Um, I've been here for a little over a year now. Um, prior to being here, I was in the Forest Service Regional Office here in Missoula, the northern region, uh, for almost 12 years. Um, I was the regional air quality and smoke management person, <clears throat> excuse me, working in the fire working in the fire shop here in the region. Um, and then before that, I came from EPA where I was doing a lot of air quality and regional haze work. Um, so I'm really, really pleased to be here and uh, really pleased to share with you um, some of the things that are going on here at the fire lab and then talk about a particular um, aspect of the lab in which I'm also the director of, which is the Fire Modeling Institute. So. Um, this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind, um, so please please bear with me as, as we go through this. Um, let me get my thing working where I can actually click there. Um, so just a few things I'm going to talk about. I want to, I want to start off by talking a bit about research and development within the Forest Service and how it kind of fits in with the agency and, and where the fire lab itself fits in within research and development within the, within the Forest Service. Um, give you a quick overview and kind of a brief history of, of who we are. <clears throat> um, and then I'm gonna go through a number of research projects that we're doing that the various scientists are doing here at the, the Fire Lab. By no means an exhaustive uh, list, but I uh, just wanted to try to highlight uh, several, several projects going on. And then again, as I said, talk about the Fire Modeling Institute. So where do we sit within research and development? Um, you know, not knowing who's who's on the, on this attendee list or, or what your familiarity is, um, the research and development branch within the Forest Service is, uh, you know, basically we have, oops, sorry, let me back up. Oh, come on, thank you. Um, where we sit within the Forest Service, basically we have four different program areas within the Forest Service, which are the ones that are highlighted in red. <clears throat> so we have natural forest systems, which is what you would normally see as our, as our regional offices, our, our ranger districts, our forests. Um, state and private forestry, which is the branch of the Forest Service that, among other things, houses the fire and aviation uh, folks. And then business operations, managing our day-to-day -day, um, business, human resources, et cetera. Um, and then research and development is the fourth. The ones that are in white here are uh, three programs that pretty much fall directly under the Chief of the Forest Service and, and really are not part of any of the other branches. Um, but looking at this, research and development is totally separate from everything else within the agency. And that's kind of the way it was designed to be from the very get-go. <clears throat> um, all the way back, you know, when the Forest Service was created. And that was really to make sure that research was an autonomous, independent organization that was not really supposed to be influenced by any of the other parts of the area. And so research could be done objectively. Um, we have about 145 research facilities uh, overall within the Forest Service. Um, we have three, basically seven stations uh, that we have scattered throughout the country, 50 experimental areas, 58 um, laboratories, again, scattered all throughout the, the, um, the states as well as uh, some facilities down in the Virgin Islands and in Puerto Rico. We have, again, basically five major research stations um, geographically oriented here, Northern, Southern, Pacific Northwest, Pacific South, Southwest, and Rocky Mountain. Um, and then also there's the International Institute for Tropical Forestry, which is down in Puerto Rico. And then also the Forest Products Laboratory, which is located in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, we, the Fire Lab, are part of the Rocky Mountain Research Station, so we house within the interior west states. Um, we are, as the Fire Lab, probably, <clears throat> I would say we're probably one of the largest, if not the largest fire research units within the agency. Um, 
and we're certainly the, mo the only ones that are doing a lot of the combustion type research, um, physical combustion research and such. Um, but all of the different uh, areas that we have here, North Pacific, Northwest, Southwest, Northern, Southern, um, they all do some aspects of fire research. Um, you may be most familiar with the wildland fire labs out there in Seattle uh, under our research station where they've done a lot of the blue sky modeling development, um, also things like the consume model and um, fire condition class systems and fire fuel tools and among other things that are out there. Um, our territory again is the 12 interior west states. Um, we're headquartered in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, and we have a number of labs as you can see scattered throughout the, the western states um, as well as experimental forest ranges and sites as well. We are one of seven programs within RMRS, um, the others being, of course, air, forest, grasslands, human dimensions, inventory monitoring, and wildlife. Um, we also have the Aldo Leopold Wilderness Research Institute, which is here in Missoula as well on the campus of the university, um, doing various uh, research in the wilderness, including fire. Um, we are kind of unique in within RMRS in that most of our employees, save for I think two, actually physically work here in Missoula at, at our building. Um, most of the other programs are really, they have, they work throughout all the other laboratories, but they're not all centered in one place. So there's a lot of virtual work that goes on. We're, we're kind of unique in that respect. So let's talk a bit about fire research. <clears throat> so Harry Gisburn is probably the person who's considered one of the fathers, one of the pioneers of research in the Forest Service, let alone fire research. Um, he began working on the Priest River Experimental Forest up in uh, northern Idaho, um, doing a lot of work with fuels treatments and such. And his, he ended up being what they call the 13th victim of Mangulch in 1948 because he was investigating the, uh, the tragedy that occurred with the smoke jumpers there about two months after the incident and had a heart attack and passed away on, on the site. Um, and that was a really, that tragedy was really disturbing to him because um, he felt that was a failure of both research and management as to why that happened. One of the people that Harry um, hired was Jack Barrows and Jack really was one of the true fathers of fire research. And he's probably the man responsible mostly for this building. Um, back in the, the 50s when federal government employees were actually legally allowed to lobby, um, Jack did a lot of lobbying and um, lobbying of Congress and managed to secure funding to build both this building as well as uh, two others that occurred around at the same time. Um, here at the dedication ceremony in, in 1960, I don't know if my mouse is gonna show or not. Um, so our building was dedicated in 1960. Um, our current director, I don't know if my mouse is showing on the screen, but our current director, our program manager, Colin Hardy, is somewhere is over in the front here as one of the little kids. His, uh, his father, Mike, was one of the first uh, research scientists here at the facility. Um, as I said before, there were two other facilities that were dedicated around this time. Um, there was a fire sciences lab in Macon, Georgia, and then another one in Riverside, California. The Macon lab closed, um, I would say, about 25 years ago. Uh, and then the Riverside still is in existence, so I'm not really sure to what extent they're still, I know they're still doing some fire research. I don't think it's as extensive as it used to be. Um, and while I'm on this picture, I, I do want to kind of point out a couple things with regards to our facility. Um, the big tall, as you can see, the concrete structure on the right, that's our combustion chamber. Um, it is the largest climate control combustion chamber in the entire world still today. Uh, it's about 40 by 40, about five stories tall. Um, we can control the temperature and the humidity in there. Uh, humidity anywhere from zero to 100%, temperature probably up to 100 degrees, depending upon what the weather is like outside. Um, 
attached to that burn chamber, uh, kind of behind it, where you see the smokestack, is our wind tunnels. And we have two wind tunnels. Uh, we have a large, a excuse me, a smaller high-speed wind tunnel, which can um, actually achieve wind speeds up to about 30 miles an hour. We don't use that currently very much just because we can't get constant wind flows through it at those high speeds. Um, but we still use it for conditioning. And then a larger wind tunnel, which can actually achieve uh, wind speeds up to about 10 miles an hour. And that's the one that we predominantly use. And both of those are tied directly into the combustion chamber. So we can actually do a lot of conditioning of conditions. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll condition the fuels in the burn chamber um, on beds to whatever desired temperature and humidity we want to see. And then we have a little, we have an elevator that will take the fuel beds and actually lift them up right into the, um, into the large wind tunnel. And we'll put them in there and we'll actually, um, that way we can do whatever wind profiles we want to do while we're burning on those fuel beds. So that was 1960. Um, in 2010, um, things have a bit changed or for our 50th anniversary. Um, you can see it in a difference. We added in 2008, we added a administrative wing over here on the left-hand side. Um, we used to have we a uh, MODIS uh, satellite receiver here in the giant ball up here, but unfortunately the parts are no longer available and it's been out of operation um, for a number of years, but the ball is still very useful to give people directions as to where to find our building out at the airport complex. Um, we also have a behind the building here now. We have a soils lab. Uh, we also have a full workshop. We have a full welding shop and a fuel, full uh, woodworking shop. And, uh, you know, we have folks on staff that will pretty much make anything that we need when it comes to making fuel beds or, or any other materials that we, that we desire. We also have a dendrology uh, laboratory where we do a lot of tree ring tree ring analysis. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So that was 2010. So here we are now in 2017. Um, and we are under renovation. Um, for the first time in 57 years, a lot of the mechanical systems, our old original boilers and everything have been moved out and replaced. Our original air handlers have all been removed. Um, <clears throat> This started last December, and it's actually due to be completed next week on June 30th, and, and everything still seems to be on schedule. It's been a pretty amazing effort. Um, but we've made a lot of improvements to the electrical systems. We've made improvements to our control systems. Uh, you can see in the lower right-hand corner, um, they're lifting the new air handler into place. The picture in the lower left is where it's going to go. They had to they spent a week jackhammering concrete out of the third floor of the, the wing uh, to get all that stuff out. So we're going to have better controls over our systems, better flexibility. Um, they removed 146 tons of steel out of there when you look at all the cast iron boilers and such. Um, so we're going to have a lot more efficiency, and, and it's really going to be uh, – be a much greater grace. We'll be able to do some great research, and and everybody's looking forward for this to be completed. Um, our biggest asset, um, as my boss Colin Hardy will always say, and I will too, is our people. Um, as you can see from this slide, we have a range of people that are um, <clears throat> that work here, anywhere from physical scientists to to engineers foresters, biologists, computer GIS specialists, um, writers and editors. What's not pictured here are the, the model makers, welders, and, and the carpenters that we have on staff, that, as well as the maintenance people. Um, we have about 80 people on staff. And again, as I mentioned, all the two of them physically are here in Missoula at this building. And um, it's a great collegial and, and a great family atmosphere and, and a great place to work and everybody's just wonderful people. Um, we have a lot of uh, <clears throat> work internationally. Um, 
a number of the projects I'm going to briefly talk about today have a number of international partners associated with them. Um, we worked just about every every continent, um, save Antarctica, uh, with a number of partners. Uh, we just recently had a visiting scientist from Spain here. We hosted recently a couple of uh, college interns from Germany that spent time with the Fire Modeling Institute uh, for six months. And um, so a lot of great work internationally. And you'll hear us a lot in the news. I don't know if anybody saw the uh, the 60 Minutes story that occurred, I think, uh, two weeks, two or three weeks ago about fires and pre fire prevention in a home where they did an interview with Jack Cohen um, here at the fire lab last, last summer. Um, that was pretty... It was personally a pretty amazing experience for me, not having to deal, having dealt with the the media so all that much uh, in my past lives. Um, but we do a lot of lot of interviews, and we do a lot of we get a lot of press and a lot of publications. Our our scientists here are just recognized as some of the most foremost experts in wildland fire and effects and such. Okay, so let's talk a bit about some of our research projects and. Um, I want to caveat this in a couple of ways as I get into this. Um, first of all, I will I will tell you that I am. This is going to be a bit of a whirlwind. Um, it's not an exhaustive list, but there there are quite a few projects I wanted to at least briefly mention. And some of these are some of the more pertinent um, projects that our scientists are working on right now. Some of this are things that I kind of that are current projects that I thought would be of interest to this group. Um, and the second thing I want to mention is that I am by no means an expert in any of these projects. Um, I can talk maybe some generalities. I left our website here below, um, www.firelab.org. And also I made a point of putting uh, um, the name of the primary researcher on each of these projects. So if you do, have any interest in any of these and more information about any of these projects, please go to our website. You can look on there. You can click on the, the scientist. You can click on the different program areas and see the research going on and get more information, get links to publications, and um, certainly feel free to email any of the scientists. I know they, they'd be more than happy to, uh, to respond to you with any questions that you may have. Um, so we do have in our charter, our current charter, six primary focus areas that we deal with here. Um, physical fire processes, fuel dynamics, smoke emissions and dispersion, fire ecology, fire fuel management strategies, and science delivery. If we go back to the past, um, <clears throat> these are some of the early pictures of some of the research. Um, a lot of the work really focused on doing conducting burns in the wind tunnels in the combustion chambers. And a lot of it was geared more towards developing tools and developing, you know, I guess models and equations to try to characterize fire in that respect so that we can put it into models so that we could try to predict um, fire behavior and fire danger. Um, a lot of the, the popular applications and systems that are known that the fire danger rating system, um, Behave Plus, Fire Family Plus. Uh, so a lot of those models were developed here in the fire lab and are still in use today. Um, <clears throat> but there was a lot of it. And I want to take note in particular this picture up in the upper left-hand corner. Um, it's, it's Dick Rothermel actually looking at the burn in the wind tunnel. A lot of what was burned then also was a lot of fuel. You know, they would learn excelsior or, or pine needles as would make up their fuel beds for their research. And we still use that, um, but we do other things as well. So we do things on a bit of a different scale when we're talking about the combustion aspects of things. Um, the picture on the left is a massive, large uh, <clears throat> burn table that we just started using, I think, within the last two years. It's about 18, 20 feet wide, about 24 feet tall. It can um, 
it can tilt. It's hydro on hydraulics, so you can tilt it to, and to match any slope. You can also tilt the two sides inward to make um, to look at valley burns. Um, it takes about a week to set up uh, a burn on on that table, and probably about two minutes at the most to actually burn it. Um, the photo on the upper right is some work that our colleagues next door at the Technology Missoula Technology and Development Center do, um, where, as I was talking about before, where you can condition the fuel bed in our burn chamber uh, and then run it up into the wind tunnel. That's what they do. And they do a lot of testing on different uh, formulations of fire retardant and how that works under different conditions. So they'll literally have 10 or 12 different fuel beds in there with various levels of fire retardant on them and uh, they'll have them conditioning in the burn chamber and then they'll whip one out and they'll take it over and lift it up into the wind tunnel and then measure how long it takes for fire to spread across the, the fuel bed under varying wind conditions. Um, and then the bottom one is uh, the middle, the bottom middle is a, is a massive crib burn that was being done um, <clears throat> a few years ago right outside our facility in the wintertime which I'm sure the County Health Department appreciated a lot. Um, but So we do things on a different scale. And, and part of the reason for this is looking at the fundamental physics of fire spread. A lot of the work that I showed in the then picture with Dick Rothermel and the others, again, they were looking at trying to develop equations for burning, and they were trying to develop equations to help predict fire behavior and such. But really, until recently, nobody had ever actually tried to look empirically at how fire behaves and the physical properties of fire. And that's what Mark and Sarah um, do a lot of. Um, <clears throat> Sarah works a lot with the cribs that you'll see here in the lower left, um, where she's using cribs, or order, basically ordered sticks, um, groups of sticks in, in some sort of organized shape. That was that massive burn, outside burn, on the previous slide. Um, looking to see how structured burns like that in, in structures, how they would maybe mimic, how they possibly would mimic, um, be mimicked out in the wildfire world. And at what level, and by varying the sticks, the space between the sticks and the, and the density of sticks, how does that affect the burning rates? Um, what Mark does, Mark does a lot of work with that large table that I showed you in the previous slide. And if you see in this slide here on the right, um, that's our program manager, Colin Hardy, showing um, actually at the time this was two members of now, uh, then representative, but now uh, Secretary of the Interior Zinke staff uh, when he was a representative. We're not using the fuel beds like pine needles and such and Excelsior anymore. Um, I mean, we're using them, but what Mark is doing is he's using cardboard. And we have a laser cutter that we can precisely cut the cardboard to any, um, you know, any width. We can have combs that are, you know, that can mimic the size of a pine needle all the way out to a, a uh, several inch long branch. Um, we can make them large, we can make them small, and then we can put them on that, on that table or we have smaller tables where then we can burn those and use those to mimic the fuels in the field. And what that does is that provides Mark with a consistent fuel bed. It takes the variability of the fuel out of the equation so that he can really get down and look at those basic physical properties of fire. Um, another project that Dr. Brett Butler has been well known for our safety zone. Um, Brett has done a lot of work, and, and those of you that have seen the um, you know, in the response pocket guide, there's always the little uh, guidance on how to determine the proper size of a safety zone. Well, Brett has really done a lot of work in incorporating some additional factors into that equation. And um, there's, there were some in, in 2014, there were some proposed safety zone rules. And I think he's, continue, he's continuing to refine that. Um, and finding out that in some instances, depending upon the type of fire and, and the conditions, the safety zones that we were approximating before just really aren't big enough. And in some cases, the safety zones should be 
really so massive that you really begin to start questioning whether you should be even being out there fighting that fire, depending upon the conditions. Um, and I know, and I don't have the link here for it, but I know there, Brett's been featured in some YouTube videos um, that NIFC has put forth that you can Google up and, and uh, have a look at him doing some better explanations about these safety zones. Um, one of our big projects that's going on right now um, that Matt Jolly's working on is changes to the fire danger rating system. And the NFDRS system began around in the 1970s. It's really been kind of static since 1978. Uh, there was an update in, uh, I think it was 88 or I think it was 1988 or maybe 98, I can't remember, sorry, um, where they added a, a several more fuel, fuel models to the equation. Um, but what Matt's been working on for the last several years is trying to simplify the NFDRS system and coming up with the new technology that we have and some of the newer models that have been put out there. Um, coming up with a simpler way to calculate fire danger that's still just as effective, if not more effective, but it's a lot more intuitive. Um, there's not as much, it's a lot more automated. It requires a lot less human intervention. And you can see just from looking at the picture here on the left, the complexity of the original NFDRS. And, um, and then looking at the one that's currently being proposed um, and how much simpler, more simpler it is. Um, one of the, there's some of the major changes, two of the really big changes that Matt was, has put into this, um, the fuel moisture models for live and dead fuels, which were a huge issue in the other NFDRS, um, have been updated with, with more relevant models. There were 40, model, 40 fuel models in the original NFDRS and, and the updates in 1988. Well, Matt's shown that they can basically be consolidated down to the five that are listed on this slide. Um, so it's a much simpler, a much, much simpler system that's going on here. Um, and here's again a summary of some of the changes that Matt is putting, putting forward. Um, no more weighed sticks, uh, no more live Bergen Life fuel model, climate classes. Um, all those things are not needed. And, and again, instead of 40 fuel models, we only have five. Um, the link down below at WIFAS.net, NFDRS 2016, uh, there's a lot of great information there. There's presentations that will go into more detail in some of these changes and the justification and why we needed to make these changes. Um, <clears throat> And uh, yeah, lost my train of thought there, sorry. Oh, that's what I was gonna say, sorry. Um, it says in FDRS 2016, it hasn't been fully released yet. It's going to be coming out um, hopefully this fall. Parts of it have been released. Um, it's kind of a, it's a bit of a process because not only do we have to release the new NFDRS, and kind of get people trained up on it, but then it requires changes to some of the um, the applications, um, such as Fire Family Plus, that that uh, estimate fire danger, and also a lot of the training materials, the the um, fire danger classes that NWCG offers and such. And we are very actively involved in working with our Washington office in uh, coordinating a lot of those efforts to to get everything finalized and out the door. Okay. Um, Wind Ninja, which is something I'm, I'm kind of particularly excited about, and I, I neglected to put the person's name on here, but uh, Dr. Natalie Wagenbrenner, W-A-G-E-N-B-R-E-N-N-E-R, is a postdoc here working for Mark Finney. Um, and she's right now the primary point of contact for Wind Ninja. Um, this was a product that originally one of our mechanical engineers, Jason Forthover, uh, it basically was his master's degree was developing Wind Ninja. And Natalie's kind of taken it over from Jason and is really um, trying to trying to really augment it, get it out for use in the field and, and incorporate some new features into it. Basically what Wind Ninja does is it, it's if you're not familiar, is it's looks at it basically looks at the 
influence of terrain on the winds. And it, it focuses on that at that level, um, particularly here, and, and I know you deal with it in Washington as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of complex terrain, and, and I know from my, you know, from my days dealing with smoke management and air quality, a lot of those models, the best you can do in terms of resolution is get down to maybe a little over a kilometer, which still in our complex terrain just isn't good enough to totally characterize the conditions. Um, so with Wind Ninja, in looking at the terrain effects, they're looking at scales of around 30 to 40 meters and trying to estimate those you know, winds at those scales and, and the constant changes that you have. Um, it's a very simple product. It's got, I think, a, I think it's got a mobile app now associated with it. If you go to firemiles.org or, or just Google Wind Ninja, um, Wind Ninja Fire, I should say, because there's a, there's a video game that has a Wind Ninja in it too. Um, you can get a lot more information about, about the product. Um, one of the things I'm particularly excited about, again, as I'm, Mike, given my background in smoke management, is a lot of the work that um, Natalie and, and Lauren Atwood, who's a, a um, <clears throat> he's a, one of our uh, temporary employees, he's, he's more of a computer person working with Natalie on this recent college graduate, um, looking at prescribed burning and looking at doing some smoke, uh, smoke management and, and uh, looking at simulating smoke plumes. And they've done a few couple of tests here in Missoula with the Lolo National Forest, um, looking at complex terrain and, and looking at varying smoke conditions and how wind changes. And, and it's promising, um, but it's still in its very early developmental stage. The whole idea truly behind this, um, I know over in Washington, you folks have, it's really challenging for you to get prescribed burns, probably more so than, than it could be here. Um, but any tool that we can help provide information, provide forecasting as to what might happen and, and provide an opportunity to better plan our prescribed burns and better um, you know, talk to regulators and such about what we're doing and what the conditions are gonna say, um, anything to help get more burning on the ground is what we're looking for. And Natalie's doing a great job working with the Lolo and with others and, and uh, you know, using Wind Ninja to help them, uh, help them do some better planning and, and get some more opportunities. <clears throat> Stampfire is a project from Russ Parsons. And Russ is a, uh, again, this is a project that actually your, uh, your colleagues here the, in uh, Montana at our Department of Natural Resources and Conservation have been really interest, been interested in and have contributed to, uh, to Russ's effort. Um, this is an effort that Russ works with Los Alamos National Laboratory and um, I, think the, I think it's the French uh, environmental folks in, over in France that um, do a lot of this physical uh, 3D physics modeling. Um, and the idea behind this model is to, again, kind of look at how effective fuel treatments are going to be. Um, there's different ways you can do it. It's a three-dimensional model. And, you know, the idea is before you do the fuel treatment, look at what the impacts are and, and look at whether it will be the most effective fuel treatment. And hopefully this will work. Um, here's a bit of an example before I hit, hit play. Um, so here in the upper left, we have our control, a control stand. Um, this is a stand up in the Swan Valley here in Montana. And then we have different crown spacings going across. Um, so this is 1.5 meter crown spacing in the upper right. Uh, down here in the lower left is three meters and here in the lower right is 4.5 meters. And if you look at the simulation, you can see how, you know, this, this, um, you know, where's it going? There it is. You can see how the fire, works through the different things. You can see in the control how you have much more crown fire, moves much more slowly, um, and you get a lot more crown consumption than you would in any of the other ones. Um, and this is some of the information that you can go, and, and you can see, basically, this is our crown control here, and um, you can look at these different treatments and see, well, which one's gonna be the best for us? And um, I was talking to Russ yesterday about this, and this is something that He's really, it's still in the developmental stages, but he's really hoping that within the next 
two or three years, um, this will be something that the field can, you know, will be out there for the field to use. It'll be um, pretty field ready, intuitive, and, and easy to use. So hopefully be on the lookout for that as something you might be able to use. Um, Mastodon is another project that's been going on for a number of years. Um, this is looking at, and Bob Keen and Pam Sickink are the, the primary people here, um, looking at, again, fuels treatments by mastication and really how effective they are and looking at how, um, you know, basically coming up with, um, coming up with fuel models that predict the fire behavior in these, in these different fuels. Um, here's a number of kind of ideas and, and pictures looking at the process here. Um, so the upper middle picture is a fuel, masticated fuel bed up in the Priest River Experimental Forest, um, where we take, and then we've taken samples from that and other ones, we've brought them down and we separated the, the different um, masticated fuels into different size classes and such. Um, doing some weighing on them we, and other experiments that Pam did with them. And then we put them on a bed and we, and we burn them just to, again, come up with the different, try to come up with the different fuel models for the different types of classes. Um, this is some work that is uh, nearing completion. Excuse me. And there should be some publications coming out. There's actually, I think, one or two publications that are now um, either in press or, or in the process of being in press on these uh, on this mastication project. Um, Lick Creek um, is kind of a unique situation. Um, looking at a ponderosa pine stand in Bitterroot National Forest, this is a project that started back in 1991, and um, Sharon Hood is now taking this project over. And looking at basically the stain stand, looking at different treatments, I think since 1991 there's been seven different fuels treatments on the stand in Lick Creek. And basically looking at the effectiveness of those treatments, um, going back and visiting those sites each year. Um, what makes Lick Creek really unique is that there are actually photographs, and, and if you go to firelab.org, you can actually see some of the photographs posted there um, taken at this site all the way back to 1909. So there's a 100 year plus record of fuel treatments um, or you know, of the stand that, that's been done after various fuel treatment, um, after or lack thereof of fuel treatments, um, showing the different stages of the stand. So it's, it's a very, very neat and very interesting long-term study um, going on to look at the effectiveness of fuels treatments in one specific stand. Um, getting into a couple of our smoke-related projects here, um, Wayman Howe is, um, he's done a lot of work recently looking at black carbon deposition. Um, right now, he, the studies that he's done recently are of northern Eurasia. Um, but he's also been more recently looking now at black carbon deposition here from fires in North America as well as from, um, you know, so United States, Canada, and Mexico is what he's working on right now. Um, still very preliminary, but from what I've seen, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I show here 2008, which was one of the higher years for emissions in the, in the black carbon, but the record actually he looked at from 2002 all the way to 2015. So it was a 13-year a record that um, Wei Min had looking at um, looking at the black carbon deposition. And again, the reason for doing this study is um, black carbon is a huge issue up in the Arctic. It affects the um, it really affects the reflectivity of the sun off the ice, and and it helps. Uh, depending upon how much black carbon there is, really has an impact on how much the ice melts up in the Arctic. And you can see just a couple of the conclusions from this. You know, depending upon the year, you're looking at 45 to 78 percent of the black carbon sources uh, deposited in the Arctic come from northern Eurasia, um, and the majority of that is from 
you know, Siberia and Russia. And a lot of the reason for this reach is just to really see how black carbon can be controlled and um, try to come up with some mitigation methods for the black carbon. Um, it's a really interesting study. And then Sean Urbanski does a lot of work, again, with smoke emissions, um, looking at verifying models uh, for, our, for our first order fire effects model, among other things. One of the um, one of the projects he's been working on, again, is looking at the, the VIRS sensor and the VIRS um, up on the satellite. I think it's the new GOES satellite that it's in. Um, and coming up with a more of a real-time burned area product. Uh, you know, a lot of, this, a lot of the um, challenges with MODIS and now with VIRS when it comes to fire detections is that they really, as you can see in the pictures, they really don't actively actually look at, they just look at a spot. So you really, it's really hard to actually characterize a fire, fire perimeter looking at um, just the, looking at just the fire detections. But what Sean is showing is that when if you look at, if you combine it with burn scar detections um, and active fire detections, so you look at those fire detections and then you look at the burn scars, um, when you're comparing it with the ground truthing of those fire perimeters, um, much like what was shown on the previous slide, you can really come to some really good agreement um, on what's going on. So this is a tool um, on the previous slide. Let me go back. The website down in the lower left, it's basically the website that takes you to the um, NWCG uh, fire, fire information. And it's, uh, I'm not sure it's active yet. It's supposed to be active sometime either this month or next month, um, but sometime this summer, this should be active and, and it'll be a great tool for, for using uh, for fire detections and um, characterizing perimeters, remote sensing. Um, tree mortality. We do a lot of, um, in addition to combustion and, and you've seen with some of the other projects, we do a lot of fire ecology work here as well. Um, Sharon's currently working on a study in California looking at um, drought conditions and looking at uh, mortality and how that's changing the fire behavior and um, looking at the changes in vegetation after the mortality. Um, and of course, you know, this was huge. It's been huge pretty much everywhere in the, in the West. I don't think anybody's been left out of the whole drought situation that has been going on. Um, but California in particular. So um, this is just a long-term study. I think it's, I think she's got another few years to go on this to come up with some information about the, the, um, the fire effects. Emily Heyerdahl um, has been for years looking at fire scars from tree rings to help understand um, different, the different forces that have contributed to fires in particular tree stands. Um, whether it's climate change, whether it's human land use, um, or other things. She's done a number of studies. Um, some of the more recent ones are Central Oregon, Northern Rockies, and in, and in Utah. Um, the picture I show here is, is interesting. It's, it's one of our teaching tools that we have here at the Fire Lab. Um, we call it the story tree, and it's a, a ponderosa pine that was cut back in, I think, 1919. And if you can see in the, uh, if you can see like in the middle of the picture, you can see the triangle where it talks about the first fire scar being all the way back in the 1300s. Um, so using this and another information with, with the tree rings, um, Emily and others can really get a good idea of the impacts over time on a, on a particular stand. Bob Keane has probably made a career, um, among other things, out of white bark pine. Um, he's done a lot of work with that pop, with those populations. Um, there's a lot of controversy. It, it's not a a common species. Um, it's a very high elevation species. Um, blister rust mountain pine beetles and uh, basically more shade tolerant species are kind of taking out the white bark pine populations and what Bob's concluded is that the only way we can save them is basically to replace them. So he's done a lot of work throughout the years looking at um, 
how can we replace the white bark pine stands? Um, you know, whether it's through fuels treatments, whether it's through prescribed burning, um, through skelet cuttings. Um, one of the things that he's worked on recently are release treatments. If we open up the canopies, if we selectively get rid of get rid of the trees and 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 um, give more space to the white bark pine, how does that affect? How does that impact it? And um, his previous research has shown that for the older species, um, for the older trees, it seems to they seem to respond really well to it. Um, but now they're working. He and um, Molly Redslaff, which is who is uh, a member of uh, the head of uh, Bob Seal Crew, um, they're doing a lot of work looking at the younger trees now. The, the field crews are out. They were out all last summer um, collecting samples at, at various high elevation sites, and they're doing that this summer as well um, to see how the seedlings and the saplings respond to the uh, to these um, open canopy and release treatments. Uh, we also do host one of the experimental forests. Um, I need to talk faster. I didn't realize my time was going. Um, so we have an experimental forest, Tender Creek Creek, established in 1961. Um, we took over the maintenance of this, I believe, about four or five years ago, maybe sooner. Um, but the site is located uh, just east of Helena near a, a little town called White Sulphur Springs. One of the reasons that it was designated in 61 is that it's a lodgepole pine forest, um, and it's a nice representative forest of, of lodgepole pine east of the Continental Divide. So there was a lot of hydrologic research going on in there. Um, back in the 80s is when they started looking more at the fire effects um, and fire behavior within the forest. And now Helen and also Sharon Hood are looking at um, some of the fire history as, as well as uh, some of the lodgepole pine stand management and, and some of the mortality in there as well. And then the last one of these before I get into the FMI, um, I want to make sure I mention Alan Ager, who's our, our newest, I guess you could say he's our newest research scientist, although he's been around for a long time and we stole him from PNW. Um, Alan's developed a basically a toolbar embedded in ArcMap called ArcFuels. Um, a lot of what Arc Fuels is doing right now is um, it could be used for forest growth and fire behavior models and innate in vegetation management and such. But a lot of, as I'll go into an FMI in a minute, um, a lot of what Arc Fuels is being used for right now is risk assessments. Um, that's becoming a very large part of the the workload that's going on um, in our station, in our agency, um, and in research, and um, so a lot of what his work is focusing on is, is some of the risk assessments. I know he's done, I think he's got maps of just about every place in the West. Um, and I know he's got some of Washington as well. Um, the website at the bottom there gives you a link to more information about Arc Fuels, and if you're interested in downloading it and using it, um, it could be found there. OK, so 10-minute rush to Fire Modeling Institute here. Um, Again, Fire Modeling Institute is is kind of a unique uh, a unique aspect of people, unique group of people here at the Fire Lab. Um, our motto is that we bring the science to the people and the people to the science. And our, our job really is to be that conduit between the research that is taking place here and the field, the public, um, you folks. Um, our Washington office and, and others. Um, if you'll remember back many slides ago where I talked about our six focus areas, the last focus area on there was, was uh, science synthesis and, and uh, delivery and tech transfer. And a lot of what the Fire, Fire Modeling Institute does for the program here is actually take on that responsibility. Um, we do a lot of the educational needs. We do a lot of the tech transfer. Um, and let me show you who we are. Um, there's me and myself as the director, and then all the smart people are under me. Um, we have spatial fire analysts, a couple of those on staff. We have fire ecologists, um, an amazing fire behavior specialist. Uh, we have 
tech transfer specialist and writers and editors. Um, it's a staff of roughly, I'd say about 15 people, um, including uh, full-time staff, part-time staff, and, and contractors. Uh, we do operate in six focus areas, analysis and support, applied science applications, data development, science synthesis, and training. Um, and we operate really, we hit all scales. We've worked with local forest all the way up to working with um, international countries, uh, doing fire behavior work in Zambia, for example, and uh, currently doing a project in, um, in South Africa looking at fire behavior of eucalyptus trees. So we, we run the gamut. Some examples of the work. Um, this is some work that was done by our fire behavior analyst, Llewyn Hollingsworth, looking at helping the Lolo National Forest, um, looking at developing new fire management zones, trying to be a little more strategic in determining their fire management units, and um, looking at prioritizing basically how they're going to, what treatments need to be done. Um, our biggest work right now is huge is uh, what's called CPAL, Community Planning Assistance for Wildfires. Um, we are working with a organization called Headwaters Economics, which is based in Bozeman, and they have a grant from the Forest Service to offer varying communities um, looking at planning for wildfires and looking at work that could eventually lead into um, lead into some looking at community wildfire protection plans, among other things. <coughs> Excuse me. The picture here is uh, some work that Greg Dillon, um, one of our geospatial analysts, has been working on in Bemidji, Minnesota. Um, our other big, big project that we're working on right now, um, Eva Carroll, our other geospatial analyst, is working on uh, Chelan County in, in Washington. Um, there have been a number of assessments in that area, Wenatchee and, and Shillan City have had assessments, and now the county is is working on theirs, and, and there's a whole, also a community wildfire protection plan effort going on. So it's all kind of kind of all meshing together, and, and we're also now working with Headwaters on uh, here in Missoula to look at their community wildfire protection plan as well. Um, we also do some work nationally with our Washington office. Uh, this is a wildfire hazard potential map um, that was put out in 2014. Again, this is Greg Dillon's work looking at hazard potential um, going forward. He's also working, I don't think I have a slide on it, he's also working on um, a national risk assessment product that it's in its final stages um, and ready to be handed off uh, to our individual regions to and for us to augment and, and update with their information. Um, I mentioned before how we have a lot of applications and model systems that are used in the fire community that were developed here. And we maintain a ton of them. Um, as you can see here, FFI, NFDRS, uh, WIFIS, FOFM, FLAMMAP, um, Farsight, Fire Family Behave, you know, all of those are maintained by the Fire Modeling Institute. Um, staff, including all the training, all the aspects, all the updates to the models and, and such. Uh, many of you may be familiar with FDIS, the Fire Effects Information System. It's been around since 1986. It was one of the original components of the Fire Modeling Institute back when, uh, back when it was fully formulated and, and uh, chartered in 2001. Um, basically, FDIS looks at species reviews. Um, basically goes grabs the literature for fire regimes or fire or anything related to fire for specific plant and animal species and they can solve that then into a synthesis that is available um, I don't have the FEIS website on there unfortunately remiss of me but uh, again you can Google FEIS and, and you can go in there and find they have information on maybe 1200 different species um, a number of fire regimes um, this is information that is double plant is basically peer reviewed internally. Um, it's defensible. Uh, anybody that has a project that they need information on, this is this is really the place to go. Um, we've done a lot of work looking at uh, collecting data and looking at air quality standards. Uh, working again with our Washington office, 
trying to find the impacts of different um, either ozone or particulate matter and how, you know, with the changing air quality regulations, how is that going to impact our forest lands and how is that going to impact the different land managers? Um, so we've done some geospatial work uh, for them trying to show those different the impacts of those varying different standards. And I mentioned tech transfer. Um, we do a lot of tech transfer around here. Um, the upper left corner is what we call our halls of science. If you walk through our building um, and you walk down the hallways here, we have various posters of the scientists' research and as well as some of the more recent publications that are free for the taking. Um, so we keep that updated. Um, we publish an annual report, uh, which is now, we haven't done uh, 2016 yet. We're still working on that. But up through 2015, we have annual reports that are on our website looking at the highlights. Um, we maintain the archives. We have a number of boxes and all the original research materials from all of our research scientists that we, we maintain in our basement and in other locations. Um, and then we do a lot of conservation education work. Um, what they're showing in the lower right is actually preparing one of our flower beds to a, be an interpretive Native American garden uh, in the back of our building that we're going to hopefully have ready to go in the next year or two. Um, we are actively involved in training, uh, whether it's bringing people through on tours. Um, we host a number of, uh, we host fire, uh, fire ecology classes from both the University of Montana and the University of Idaho and, and other things. Um, we are very active in wildland fire training. As I mentioned before, we we actively participate in, in the the NWCG classes that are that feature some of our materials and, and our training and models. We help develop the training materials. We help teach the classes. Uh, we're very actively involved in that aspect of it. Um, and in fireworks, and I know Ralph was kind of mentioning this pre before the, before we were talking about um, some of the work we do with the children. We do a lot of work. We have our own training curriculum for fire ecology called fireworks, where we can either go out to the schools, as is shown in the, the bottom picture, or we bring students here. We, we probably reach well over 1,000 students every year um, teaching them fire ecology at different grade levels, um, on anywhere from, you know, third grade all the way up to, to high schoolers. And we do a, a lot of work with, um, a lot of work with them. Um, we recently, just last week, we hosted a fireworks uh, training for teachers. We actually have <clears throat> trunks of fireworks equipment that the teachers can check out, and they can bring these fire ecology lessons into their own classrooms. And it's not just Montana and Idaho. I mean, we've, we've had a person from Colorado last year, and we've done lots of teachers from Washington, and we've developed specific trunks for Native Americans and for the Plumas um, tribe. So anyway, I, the last part was really quick, um, but I think our time is about right about close to an end. Um, you know, one of the other things that we do a lot here is curling. Um, and we have a lot of fun with that. I uh, will mention our website, www.firelab.org. Again, you can get all sorts of information there. Um, I also want to mention really quickly um, that we, much like this, we host a seminar series here. Um, it starts in October and usually runs through the end of May or sometimes into June. Every one of our seminars is recorded. It's hosted on Thursdays at 11 o'clock in the morning mountain time. Um, all of our seminars are recorded. If you go to firelab.org, the first thing you'll see right in front of you is a link to the 2016-17 seminars. You can go on there and view any of the recordings of any of the any of the topics. And then also our um, also our uh, uh, you know our hope this October is that we're going to be able to offer kind of a live streaming through Adobe Connect on our webinars. We're, we're kind of experimenting with that this summer, and hopefully that will be available.